Good afternoon. Um, for our class today, we will um, step back. Last week, we, I, I like to paint a general picture in our first lecture about the statistics and the overall picture of the here and now. Uh, so in painting the picture of the here and now, I show you kind of demographically or what our inmate population looks like today. All right, typically in my second lecture, I actually step back and kind of explain how we've kind of gotten to this point. We haven't always used prisons as our dominant means or dominant method of punishment. And so what I try to do in this particular lecture is kind of walk back and explain how we got to this point. Okay? Uh, we'll pick up in some of our subsequent classes, we'll take on some additional more contemporary pressing topics such as capital punishment, wrongful convictions, and other things. But this particular lecture is a lot more going back into the past. With our history of, of, of punishments and corrections in our society, before we do that, I think it's important to understand kind of some of the, the goals that we hope to accomplish when we punish people. Behind all of our various punishment methods that we've utilized throughout society, um, there's always been a certain number of goals that we aspire to achieve. One of the first and foremost, most important ones is punishment for the sake of punishment, which is more or less the retribution, the concept of an eye for an eye. Uh, you did this, so we do this to you, kind of thing. Uh, so behind some of our early punishment methods, leave in prison today, all right, there's a certain element of this retribution con component of eye for an eye. We also punish people for deterrence purposes. Uh, this is one that I remember as a child, uh, when my, my, parents, my parents were adamant deterrence theorists, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that uh, we punish people because we don't want them to do it again <laughs> in the future. All right, so with deterrence theory, the general concept is that we punish you, and, and you won't do it in the future. You are specifically deterred, but I was also a good learner, and we have a concept called general deterrence, meaning that I saw my brother, who's three years older than me, get punished for something, and I didn't do it. So deterrence can work in two different ways. We also have uh, punish people for incapacitation. Incapacitation has more or less to do with protecting society. We want to eliminate or significantly reduce someone's ability to further harm someone else, so we incapacitate them. The ultimate form of incapacitation is obviously capital punishment. Um, we also punish people for rehabilitation purposes. We punish people uh, and, and for rehabilitation in terms of for this particular goal. There's something that's obviously wrong with a person, presumably. And part of our goals and why we punish people is we want to fix them, we want to rehab them. Now this is debatable with regards to how much of this we actually see transpire in our prison system today, but it is still something that's listed and mentioned as a goal. Additionally, we also punish people for restitution. Restitution is the one where the victim comes into play. We punish people to bring some sense of justice or some sense of closure to the victims of crime. All right? uh, restoring the victim to some presum presumable place where they feel better about what they've gone through. Uh, and lastly, boundary setting. Boundary setting has more or less to do with, we punish people to kind of set the parameters for what it takes to live among us. All right, we have acceptable do's and don'ts, and you do something on the don't list, then we have a special place that we put you called prisons. All right, so we boundary, we establish our boundaries in terms of what it takes to live, live among us. These are some of the goals that we've always had in mind with all of our different forms of punishment, and prison is no different. So we punish people when we send people to prison today, all right, largely to obtain or to achieve these various goals specified here. What's different about how we view prison today? Today, prison is viewed largely as our really only form of punishment that we utilize pretty heavily. Okay? In our society, unfortunately, if it ain't prison, it ain't punishment. All right? For a lot of our politicians and for a lot, of, a lot of folks, the way in which they think, if it's not prison, it's not punishment. Whereas in other societies that are equally as, equal to us size-wise and may have crime problems that may actually even resemble ours, they utilize other forms of punishment, alternatives to incarceration, whereas for us, Prison is still our dominant form of punishment that we utilize. How we got to this point, uh, historically, our first prisons actually opened in 1790, is when we got our first official prison in, our United, in the U.S., but how we've described them in the, in the naming of our facilities says a whole lot about some of the goals and what we aspire to obtain and what we thought would take place there. Early on, we refer to, we refer to prisons, as we call them today, pen, as penitentiaries. All right? Uh, so if anybody ever told you they just got a penitentiary, they've been in for a very long time because most places are not referred to as penitentiaries anymore. All right? Penitentiaries 
go back to uh, the early, early formations of correctional facilities in our society. So Tennessee State Penitentiary, uh, Tennessee State Penitentiary for Women, all these different places, if the name penitentiary is in the, in, in the title itself, that facility was probably built sometime between 1790 and 1870. So it's a very old building. And surprisingly, we actually still have some of those in operation. Uh, Brushy Mountain out in East Tennessee was recently closed about five years ago, but Brushy Mountain dates back to the 1860s, 1840s. It had been around for a very long time. Events that we, uh, in addition to penitentiaries, but with, oh, let me go back. When we first seen those penitentiaries, uh, the root of that word, penance, what is penance? Sorrow. Hmm? Saying you're sorry. Saying you're sorry, re reflecting on what you've done, kind of, you, you go in penance, you reflect on kind of what you've done. And so when we talk about some of our early penitentiaries, uh, I'm a social butterfly for the most part. I could not have done prison in our early prison systems where it was basically we lock you in a room and say, good luck, we'll see you in 10 years. The, the whole concept was that we gave you time. We gave you a very extended time out to kind of sit and think about what you've done. Um, eventually, we transitioned. We realized that that model didn't work. And so we experimented with what we call reformatories. Elmira up in upstate New York is one of our most infamous reformatories. Uh, but when we shifted to this reform model, the basic notion and idea was we had to provide more than just religious doctrine to basically help people better themselves. We had to provide some aspect of vocational training, uh, teach people some type of skill, provide academic training. Uh, we opened up our facilities to provide a whole lot more in terms of what we made avail available for inmates to take advantage of. You'll see that, unfortunately, we've, our, our reform period or reform efforts, we've kind of swung back and forth as a pendulum. For one decade we'll be here, another decade we'll go back, and we kind of swing back and forth. Today, when we think about prisons in the broader scheme of things, it's more or less we refer to them as corrections. So we've gone from penitentiaries to reformatories, and now it's kind of pretty much corrections is how we look at it. And corrections encompasses a whole lot more than just the prisons. Corrections can encompass uh, the outside or a halfway house components. It can encompass probation, parole. Like the Tennessee Department of Corrections includes any number of different things that theoretically fall within this punishment umbrella, but is not as exclusionary as, say, just reformatories or penitentiaries from the past. In getting to this point, there were some key people uh, when we first started, you know, I won't go all the way back, and normally, normally this is a three-hour lecture, but I have to pull out enough slides to get this in an hour and 15 minutes. But I won't go through all of the slides that I, I've, some of the slides that I've pulled out, I'll tell you. We start with talking about, you know, going back to the frugal days when we were uh, living in very, very small cities and things of that nature. But eventually we got to the point where we start living in large clusters as cities start to develop. And when we start living in large clusters, we needed to formalize our own police and prison and policing systems in terms of how we went about executing justice. We couldn't leave it into the laws of the hands, rather, of individual people, because so then we get the Hatfields and McCoys, which is probably still going on. Uh, but ba that dates back to this era where we had people taking justice into their own hands. But eventually, as we get to where we had cities develop, uh, we needed to kind of formalize our punishment system. And there were some key people that played a part in helping us formalize our punishment system. Uh, I'll go through some of these key people uh, because they're important and, and important enough to know and understand the role that they played in helping us get to where we are today in terms of how we use prisons. One of the first people I always talk about is a gentleman by the name of Cesare Beccaria. Uh, he was a classical criminologist, uh, classical school of criminology. I'm a criminologist by trade. Um, classical school of criminology is basically based on this notion that Humans are rational thinking creatures. We're all rational thinking creatures in that our behavior is driven by this process called hedonistic calculus, in that we go through this continuous weighing of pros and cons. We weigh the pros of our behavior against the cons of our behavior. And any time the pros outweigh the cons, that's what guides our decisions, all right? I do it every day. Um, when I get up and I'm thinking, do I go this route or do I go that, that route? Which route's going to get me there quicker? I'm weighing pros and cons. We, don't, we may not think about it intentionally, uh, but Cesare Bakari would argue that all humans do that. Given that, uh, he would argue that we're rational thinking creatures who, who weigh the pros and cons. And what that must mean is that for me to make the decision to engage in crime means what? Hmm? I, I made a rational choice. <laughs> I made a rational choice, but somehow the pros of me doing something, engaging in this crime, outweighed the cons that I perceived. Okay? And so one of the things that he first argued was that as a society, what we must do is we must somehow make the pros significantly less than the cons. So we've got to increase the punishments. Okay? We have to make punishments seem severe enough to outweigh the pros that we may potentially gain. He also gave us some other general principles that 
are, are very, uh, even though he was pretty dated in terms of when he was making a lot of these arguments, a lot of his principles eventually became staples in what our criminal justice system looks like today. One of those things that he proposed was this notion that uh, the purpose of punishment is to prevent crime, which is a basic deterrence argument. Like the whole reason for why we punish people is not to, uh, to take personal justice into our own hands for any other reason, but the primary reason why we punish people is to prevent crime. We want to prevent anybody from doing this in the future, that person as well as anyone else. He also argued that crime is an injury to society and not just the victim. And this is one where I have a lot of fun when I talk to my class about this all the time when I asked them to describe the last time they watched a crime show on TV. And think about this for you guys as well. Last time they watched a crime show on TV or where there was a court case, um, where was uh, the victim? A non-murder case. Where, where did the victim sit? But usually in the audience with the other people there to see, all right? Uh, when you witness the folks down front, you typically may have a table with the, the defendant, an attorney, and the prosecuting attorney at the other table. The victim may be sitting among you right in the front row, but again, it plays on the notion that society is the victim, all right? At that point in time, although this individual person may have been damaged, society is the person who's prosecuting them. Much like if I engage in a crime right now, it's the state of Tennessee versus Roosevelt Noble, not Roosevelt Noble versus whoever I stole something from. It's the state of Tennessee, okay, because the society is the victim. And this is something that goes back as far back as Cesare Vicario and his teachings. He also note, argued that the accused has the right to a speedy trial and humane treatment. Speedy trial is relative. <laughs> All right, speedy trial is relative. I, I heard a few people smirking when I that one came, especially if it's a capital punishment case. I tell students there's some folks that when we go to the lower side of Riverbend and we go to the death row unit, there's some folks that have been there almost since I was born. Um, and now they've had their day in court, but in terms of when their punishment was actually completely carried out or executed, um, that date hasn't come. So, but this is one of the notions of what he argued. He also argued that the punishment should fit the crime, not the criminal. What we realized is that we had, much like we do today, so this is one that still has some relevance today, and that we have certain categories of offenders who may be punished more severely, uh, may be punished more harshly, just based on the demographic profile. And how we may have certain categories of victims who where if your victim fits this particular demographic, you're more likely to be punished more severely, more likely to be punished more harshly. Uh, but he argued that we should basically equalize and do away with the bias that he observed in our system even at that point in time. Punishment had to be certain, swift, and severe in order to be an effective deterrent. Certain, swift, and severe. Certainty is the most important one. I'll go ahead and give you that one right away. He said the punishment had to be certain in the sense that we as society have to, have to believe that if I do X, I will be caught and punished. All right? The problem is, as we shared in the last class period, right, we're not very good at catching people as a society. All right? Anybody remember the statistic we gave from last class period on the overall number of crimes that result in somebody actually being arrested? 20%. So again, I'm not encouraging anybody to pick up a new hobby, but if you, knew that, <laughs> if you knew that statistically, the overall chance of you being caught and arrested for a crime was 20%, that doesn't do a whole lot in terms of the certainty of punishment, okay? Severity, swiftness of punishment has more or less to do with from the time you commit the offense to the day that the punishment is actually carried out. We want that time period to be as short as possible. Uh, severity, we want to make sure that the punishment is severe enough to deter you, but not so severe that judges and other people are less likely to impose it. We saw this happen some when California went to three strike laws. There were some judges that basically refused to impose that punishment because they felt like it was too severe. Not all felonies are created equal. You can have someone who was caught shoplifting on three different occasions, but the amount just happened to be above the petty larceny range and across into the grand larceny range, and now this person's looking at life in prison. All right. Um, but Bec Beccaria basically argued that punishment had to be certain, swift, and severe in order to be an effective deterrent. Uh, Imprisonment, he argues, should be more widely used, because up until this point when he's writing, uh, we were using imprisonment, but it was primarily something that we only did to, for people as they were pretrial detainees. We housed people while they were waiting for their trial date to come up. We would house them in jail type of situations or settings that we called goyos and we called hulks. But it wasn't their punishment. Their punishment may have been some fine or something else that they receive, and we just simply held them temporarily. But he's arguing that we need to kind of think about making this the end goal like this should be the punishment. So he's one of the first people to kind of espouse that, that theory. Another person that I want to add in here is a guy by the name of Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham is, is also a classical school of criminologist. Bentham 
is credited as the person who came up with the notion of hedonistic calculus, which I've mentioned before, which is how we all engage in this weighing of the pros and cons. Uh, anybody actually a list person where you have major decisions to make you actually make out a list? Or you engage in hesitant calculus. You're kind of looking at what are the pros and cons of me actually doing this. And that's what Jeremy Bentham kind of gave us early on. And basically this notion of the idea that uh, when you're engaging in crime, it brings you some sense of pain or it brings you some sense of pleasure. And he believed that we should not only, we can go beyond what Cesare Baccaria told us, but he also was the first person that got us to thinking about how can we actually design prisons to be effective deterrents. So Bakaria gave us the notion that we should use imprisonments more. Jeremy Bentham comes along and says, hey, I think we can, we, we can use it more, and this is how we should design them. This is a way in which we can design them to effectively obtain uh, control, order, and reform. He actually came up with his design as part of the 1779 English Penitentiary Act. The 1779 English, Penit English Penitentiary Act came about as a result of work that was done by John Howard, who I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, but he came up with this design for a prison, and he called this design the Panopticum. When we break this design down, panopticum means everything in a place of sight. Anybody from the Midwest and know what a grain silo looks like? I'm from the country, country roads of Illinois, so I know what a grain silo looks like as well. But his design was basically a circular structure that resembled kind of a grain silo. And I'll, talk, I'll give you, show you a picture of it in a second, but essentially he had this huge circular structure that he proposed. And in this circular structure, uh, it was kind of a hollowed out circle with cells along the wall, much like you guys are all in your chairs now, uh, it would be a hollowed out area. Uh, I would be essentially the correctional officer in this two-way glass type structure, meaning that I can see out and see you, but you can't see me. You don't know when I'm looking at you or I'm looking at somebody over here or somebody over here. You don't know precisely where I'm looking at, okay? And so his whole notion was that we can control my behavior by having power be visible meaning that you all can see me in this tower, or see this tower, so you know that this power is here and it exists, so it's visible, but it's unverifiable. It's unverifiable because you don't know when I'm looking precisely at you, or I'm looking over here, or you don't know where I'm looking at, okay? Uh, so his, that was part of his basic design, was visible and unverifiable power. Also in this particular model, he proposed that uh, solitary confinement, solitary confinement was a huge feature in our early prison designs, all right? We didn't really believe in letting people congregate, uh, we kept people in isolation for extended periods of time. Uh, religious self-reflection. Religion has always been a key component of, of, of our prison system. All right? We have a whole lot of people who find Jesus, find God, find whatever they want to believe in when they go to prison. Unfortunately, some of them leave it when they leave, but they found it while, <laughs> while they were there. Uh, but religious self-reflection has always been a part of our prison system. Discipline through self-inspection. Uh, was also something that was a component, and we find elements of this even today. Uh, at the Tennessee Department of Corrections today, for example, if you are an inmate, um, there are cell inspections. Uh, you can't just simply keep your cell how you want to keep it. Um, they have to actually get up and make their bed, um, something my kids could learn to do. Uh, but there's, they have actual rules and things that you have to follow as far as discipline through inspection. Hard reformers of labor. All right, in different times in our country's history, we've had various aspects of labor. And most of this labor was designed to break the inmate's will, essentially. Uh, but in some cases, it was actually designed to turn a profit. And we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of how we've tried to profit off of inmate labor. This is an actual picture of a panopticum design. So you can see that it's a hollowed out. Uh, you got the guard tower here, and these are the old cells. This is actually not one that's in use. Uh, this is an outside shot of a circular design. This particular design didn't, never really took off in the, in the U.S. This is one of our early thrown out designs. And the only place it was built, anybody from Illinois? You know, or St Joliet and Statesville? Uh, Statesville, Illinois. Uh, I'm from Illinois. My dad actually worked as a correctional officer at Statesville for about two days and realized he wasn't about that life. Um, but this is Statesville in Joliet. And this is the only place in our country where you actually find that design where we have these circular housing units. Coincidentally, this is one of the worst run prisons in our country, uh, largely because that particular design didn't really work. And so in subsequent years, as they built and added on at Joliet, they added on in this particular design, which we'll talk about in a few slides, which is a slightly different prison design. Another key person, uh, so J J Jeremy Bentham is again moving us closer, and he gets, he's getting us thinking about how we can architecturally design prisons. Uh, but another person who comes along and gets us to thinking more about how do we actually manage prisons when we full fledged de-launched him, is a guy by the name of John Howard. John Howard was a sheriff 
he was appointed chair, uh, but upon taking his post, he was actually appalled by the conditions and declined his post and then instead started to study places of confinement. So he went on this tour uh, of studying places of confinement throughout England. And he noted everything about food conditions, cell conditions, staff, uh, and basically wrote the book on this is the state of prisons as we know them today, or place, state of places of confinement. Published in 1777, uh, this was actually the driving force behind the English Penitentiary Act. So the English Penitentiary Act, where Jeremy Bentham made the entry of the Panopticum as part of the essay contest, was actually largely driven by John Howard's work. Um, in this act, one of the things that is, that is specified, which is important to understand, because our places of confinement up until that point were largely privately ran, so this concept of CCA or core civic, as they call themselves now, that's not new. Uh, a lot of our early jails and goyles and hulks and things of that nature, they were privately ran um, and, and they had horrible conditions. And so with the English Penitentiary Act is where we first start to clean up some of that. Specify secure and sanitary conditions, uh, systematic inspections. Systematic inspections, when we had these privately ran jails, that there was no governmental oversight, we had no one, no one to come in and check in and make sure that people were actually doing what we expected them to do. Um, the abolition of fees. We have systems where you may be sent to a jail because you could not pay a fee, a fine that was imposed on you, but while you're there, this private jailer can charge you a fee for your housing. And I can charge you a fee to feed you. And so you're basically a trapped indentured servant because this, the, it's, a, it's a circle. You're here because you couldn't pay the fine, but while you're here, I can charge you for all the services I provide for you. Okay? And so we sought to finally abolish the fee system. Um, Development of a reformatory regimen. We want to kind of. That's what we do today. We have, there are elements of that today. I will tell you that we do have that today. Um, when we th especially when we think about the court costs that may get added onto a person's conviction. They get released. Uh, you get released. You, you can't get your driver's license because you still got these court costs. You pay your court costs and then you discover you also got child support. You, can, you can't pay your child support so you don't get your driver's license back. You can't get a job. So good luck figuring out how you're going to make money to pay all that back. Because again, you can't get a driver's license, so you can't get from A to B. We have, there's a lot of cyclical nature to even what we do in our criminal justice system today. Uh, one of the main things that uh, John Howard is a significant force, he pointed out the ways in which prisons, if we design them in a more humane fashion with very formalized rules, it could work. All right? And he specified and defined essentially a total institution all right, he defined prisons as total institutions, and I'll give you, and prisons are total institutions, and I'll tell you what that means on this next slide. Uh, essentially, and even in our early prisons, and especially today, we design prisons to be total institutions. Total institutions tend to be places where we have all activities pertaining to a person's life take place under a single, single roof, single location, under a single authority. All right, so prisons, we have Single authority is the state, and loosely defined, driven on down to the commissioner, driven on down to the warden. That's the single authority in the mission statement. Uh, everything, everything that you do in prison takes place in the immediate company of, of others, large batch of others who are similarly treated, another characteristic of a total institution. Uh, tightly scheduled activities. Anybody's parents tell you that idle time was the devil's play shop? In prison, prisons are largely ran like that, and, we, and they were ran like that even early on. We realized that if we give people too much free time, and free time is in quotation because it's prison free time, it's not really free time, uh, but if we give people too much free time, uh, that gives them the time to think about ways in which they can c continue to be devious, continue to engage in criminal activity, and so forth. So in prison environments, everything is tightly controlled. We also have the removal of status symbols. Prisons are inherently, they were designed then, and they're designed now to be such that we try to strip you of your status when you come in. You can have all sorts of money, you can be from the Rockefellers or anything else, but when you put on that same prison outfit as the, the individual in your cell who didn't come from money, uh, we've removed kind of as much as we can the status symbols. We can't, we don't allow you to differentiate yourself. Everything is brought together under a single rational plan. In most cases, the single rational plan is our mission statement. The tennis, every Department of Corrections, or every state for the most part, has a Department of Corrections, that Department of Corrections has a mission statement, that mission statement drives and infuses everything about what happens in that facility. Um, so this is kind of structurally what John Howard described in terms of if we do it this way, it can work. And eventually we got to that point to where we actually started building facilities, and these are kind of some of the guiding principles that led our early efforts in, in prisons. When we think about another person, I'm getting us closer to where we actually had our first prison, our first prison 
largely came under the tutelage of Dr. Benjamin, Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush was one of our original signers of the Declaration of Independence. Um, in addition to having that role, he was also a leader of the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Misery of Public Prisons, which was a kind of a think tank org, public policy type org. This is the group that actually was responsible for getting us our very first prison. Our very first prison in our country actually opened in 1790. Uh, and this is a trick question. Most of my students missed this question on the exam, uh, which I have to grade this weekend. Um, the Walnut Street Jail is actually our first prison. What happened was we had the Walnut Street Jail, and they converted a wing of that facility into long-term incarceration. All right, so it was a, a jail. Most people know jail is short-term uh, pre-trial detainees, but we converted a wing of that facility into a prison, meaning that this is the end all, end goal for a certain population of people. Their punishment is they will be housed here for an extended period of time. So we got to our very first prison in 1790. Coincidentally, I have been to this site. If you are ever in Philadelphia, uh, and you find Walnut Street, uh, and I can't tell you exactly where it is because I had to walk it. I walked about five miles and eventually found a sign on Walmart, Walnut Street that said, here once stood the first prison ever built in our society. I was very disappointed. I, I thought I was going to find something more than just a historical marker, but I've been to that spot. Um, the new prison design, the Walnut, prison, the Walnut Street Jail in this particular wing was built on an entirely different philosophy than the Panopticon. I told you the Panopticon didn't really take off because we didn't like that structural design of the circle. What we did instead, uh, we developed what we call the Pennsylvania system. And the Pennsylvania system, so when we first started prisons in 1790 and, and this particular model stayed into effect until about 1820 is when we changed it. The Pennsylvania system, largely modeled after Walnut Street Jail, uh, the most infamous of these was Eastern State Penitentiary, which opened in 1829. Uh, I'll kind of talk through some statistics and then I'll, or some general descriptors and then I'll show you a picture of what it actually looked like. Uh, it was basically built to look like a windmill. If you can imagine an architectural structure that looks like a large scale windmill, where you have a uh, central hub, then you have housing units that radiate out from this central hub. Okay? And in this design, in this central hub, um, you had very narrow hallways. You had, each person had, they had a cell, and each cell had an adjacent exercise yard. And by exercise yard, this is not like a huge structure by any means. Exercise yard was probably a uh, three by four, three by five inch. Like today we would call it a dog kennel, but they call it an exercise yard back then, so it wasn't very large. Uh, in these, so you can go through the small door in the back of your cell and go out into your individual exercise yard. But what was interesting was that you never left that structure for anything. Uh, this is what an aerial shot of Eastern State Penitentiary looks like. So you have the central hub here. And then you have all these housing units. Long, narrow hallways. You have a room through your door. You have an exercise yard in the back. What's interesting about these walls, uh, uh, most of our early facilities in general, they were built by inmates. Uh, we've always utilized inmate labor as much as we can. Uh, and early on, what I tell students, what you see on TV about people tunneling their way out of prison, that's all for TV. Uh, these walls are like icebergs. And what do we know about icebergs? The majority of it is below the surface. So while you may see this 10-foot structure above, it goes down about 30 feet. And it's pretty solid. And it's pretty thick. All right? So that's how in our early prisons, these were very expensive to build and very expensive to maintain, which is why in any of our new prisons today, they look nothing like that, because we realize that's too much brick and mortar. We have a lot more razor wire fence and things of that nature. This is a shot of an inside cell of an Eastern State Penitentiary facility. This is one that was retrofitted after the fact because initially they only had one bed because you didn't have a cellmate. All right? But over time, one of the things we've developed or one of the things we noticed was that a lot of our facilities that were built to house individual people, as we became more and more crowded, we started putting two people and three people in cells that were initially designed to house one person. All right? And so it became very crowded very quickly. Complete solitude. This Pennsylvania system was also known as a separate system, but one of the key features of it is, is complete solitude. Um, you never left your cell. Uh, you didn't know the person to your left or to your right. And one of the ways in which they maintained that was the day you were brought in, you were brought in with a hood over your head. So you're brought in with a hood over your head, and you just basically wind up in your cell. You don't know the person on your right. You don't know the person on your left. The whole idea was for you to leave that facility as ignorant of the people 
le left and right of you as the day you came in. All right? And the primary goal was to prevent contamination. Prevent contamination meaning that in terms of disease and illness, but also in terms of you learning how to be a better criminal. If we let you intermingle with other people, you can learn additional criminal ways. Housing separate cells never left their cell. Um, again, the goal was to make you as ignorant as the day that you came. You should be that same way when you leave. You slept, ate, worked in your cell. Um, you allow minimal contact with guards and a chaplain. And a few positive, but very few people had actual, actual extra, extra visitors. Okay? In some cases, they would bring you some solitary labor. The labor wasn't designed to do anything more than break the monotony of you sitting alone in your cell. Somebody tell me what do you think would be a consequence of this particular design? I think, I've heard a few people mumble it. What, what would drive you crazy about this? Insanity. Any social butterflies would have a very hard time being locked in a room by yourself? I tell them, I try to get my students to do it. I say, imagine I, for a weekend, just lock yourself in the bathroom in your dorm room. Most of them couldn't, wouldn't take that bet. Uh, but, that's, but that's what we did, and people were, for 10, 15 years, in these situations where they were maintained with very minimal contact to other people. Eventually, we left, walked away from this model, and we proposed a different model, um, the Auburn system. This Auburn system was a little more people-friendly in terms of contact and interaction with other people, and this is pretty, a lot more similar to kind of even what we do today and how we manage prisons today. Um, our first facility that was kind of built on the, around this design opened around roughly 1817. Uh, what was different about this one, it was kind of more of a hollowed out rectangle. In this hollowed out rectangle, the cell, housing units were, were stacked up on top of each other. And the cells were placed back to back. But there were some general philo philosophical differences about this facility as well. Um, there was no exercise yards because they, it wasn't needed. The, the inmate cell was only supposed to house this individual at night while they slept. During the day, you were actually permitted to be out of your cell, and you worked in groups. And, and working in these groups, you were able to do something profitable, the good old American way, right? So the Auburn design was built more around, we can house inmates in their cell to sleep at night, but during the day, we can allow them to work in congregate to do something profitable, so we can somehow turn a profit on this thing called prisons. Um, in this model, again, they slept in their cells at night, but were allowed to congregate during the day in factories. And we actually had companies that would set up their factories within prison walls. And these factories that are set up within prison walls had access to inmate labor. The inmates would sleep at night, get up, and go work in these factories during the day. Uh, as you can obviously imagine, that proposed some unfair labor advantages because inmates don't make minimum wage. All right? uh, if you have a job making 50 cents an hour in prison, you are considered a high roller. All right? 50 cents an hour is a high paying job. The average is about 21 cents an hour. Uh, and I believe TDLC just instituted a raise where the, the floor now becomes, I think, 26 cents an hour is the, the minimum wage now as opposed to 21 cents an hour. Uh, congregate and silent. So while you were still allowed to work together in a group, you still couldn't talk. So imagine, if you will, working next to somebody for eight hours a day and you can't talk to them. Because if you talk, you endure physical punishment, pain. They put you through all sorts of brutal punishments for talking. All right. Uh, so inmates had to get clever. Inmates developed all sorts of ways to communicate that we still use today. There's some inmates that know sign language. They pass kites. They do all sorts of innovative and creative ways of communicating, but it all goes back to these early days when we didn't allow them to talk to each other. I'm going to show you a picture of what one of these looks like. I've talked through most of these already. Uh, but this is an aerial shot of, say, an Auburn-style prison. In an Auburn-style prison, again, we have these, we don't have that windmill look, we have these long hollowed out rectangular structures that have multiple levels of cells inside them with cells stacked back to back. This is an inside shot. So you can see you have different floors of cells as opposed to the earlier design. But these are cells that are again designed for people to simply be in during the day. If you've ever watched a prison movie and you've seen the correctional officer walking along the, the, the walk and he's just looking in these bars that's an Auburn-style prison. These, these doors have been retrofitted in this particular picture, but when you in the, in, imagine one of those old prison movies where you see a guard walking along and they're looking in bars as they go from cell to cell, that's an Auburn-style prison. The major criticism against both of these, the, the main one we've already talked about in the Pennsylvania system, we realized that we were, it was negatively impacting people's mental health. Uh, in the Auburn system, one of the things we realized is that prison discipline because we let people work in groups, it's very difficult to keep people quiet when they work in groups, and so we had to have more staff. With more staff, we also added more 
punishments to keep people following the rules even though we allowed them to work in groups. And what all this did was it basically made it more expensive than we anticipated. And so when we, we thought we were going to be able to turn a profit and make prisons profitable for us, we didn't factor in the fact that we were going to have to pay for all this additional labor, which is going to make it more expensive in the long run. The Auburn model ultimately won out because we had this little contest, essentially, in terms of which one would be better for our country. Uh, but the Auburn model largely won, out, largely won out because of money. For the next 150 years, basically every prison that we built in our society from 1820 uh, up until the 1970s looked very much like the traditional Auburn style prison. Today we have what we call more of a modular design, uh, but most of our facilities that were built in this range, uh, 1820 to 1970, look very much like the Auburn style prisons. The Pennsylvania model was more preferred in European countries. That fan with that uh, windmill look, that was more preferred in European countries, whereas in our country we went with, went with more of the Auburn style. Uh, economics. All right, it came back down to money, and I'll talk about money more, more specifically on this next slide, but uh, the biggest thing that drove us to, to, to adopt the Auburn style of prison was the fact that we could turn a profit. And so what we actually had started happening, states started engaging in this contest to see who could build the most largest gothic looking Auburn style prison. And Tennessee had a very nice entry in there. Anybody ever been to the walls? If you've been to the walls, you've seen that, that building before. All right, so again, this goes back to every state was building these huge gothic looking structures. Like it became a contest of who could build the most castle like looking prison. And this was intentional. The look of these were intentional. The goal, and this, this has one of the structures that used to be in front of this building, is, is not there in this particular picture. But the goal was when you walked into this facility, how do you feel? You feel small. The goal was for you to feel small. The goal was for you to symboli symbolically, symbolically recognize, brother, that this was bigger than you. Okay? And so we had these huge Gothic looking structures, and then we'd have you walking through this little door. Okay? Uh, the walls is, is we know when we toured, I used to be able to take my class out there for a tour, but we actually shoot a lot of prison movies there now. That's one of the main, only reasons to actually keep it open. Um, prison labor. We can't, uh, and the last time we went, I was kind of glad they told us, but there's still asbestos in that building. Um, but my class toured there, the last time we toured there was 2010. Uh, but they filmed like scenes from the Green Mile were filmed there. Um, yeah, so any, any prison movie that you can think of that was filmed like in maybe the last 15, 20 years, some aspect of it was shot there. And what's interesting is that when you go into it, certain parts of it would look like look like it should look for a build, building that's been sitting idle that long. And then you're walking to another part and it looks very modern, very new, because that's where the movie crews would come in and fix it up to kind of, they, they were shooting those particular areas of it. We call it the castle, not the wall. You call it the castle? Yeah. Okay. Well, inmates call it the walls. So if, I tell my students all the time, if they're ever talking to an inmate and they mention the walls, that means they've been in prison for a little long time because the walls haven't been in operation since 95, I believe. Yeah, the Riverbend didn't open until 89. Riverbend opened in 89, and this one, I think the last batch of inmates kind of left around that same time or a few years after. But prison labor, how we've used prison labor, all right, because there's some interesting ways in which we use prison labor today. Prison labor was the main selling feature in terms of why Auburn won out over the Pennsylvania design. And again, it goes back to this notion or concept that we could turn a profit using inmate labor. We use inmate labor in a couple of different ways. Um, I'll get to that particular slide when I some go over how we've used it. One way in which we use MA labor then, and we still have this one in existence now, is what we call public works. All right? We use MA labor to perform tasks or produce goods that are for the general benefit of the public. So when you see, I think right down, 20, or right down West End, you may see inmates picking up trash along the interstate. That's public works. All right? uh, we've also used MA labor. This one we don't do quite as much, but there's still some aspects of this. The contract system. With the contract system, uh, and this goes a lot back to the Auburn style design, we would actually let a company set up their factory within prison walls. Um, the facility, the prison officials would provide security. We would do all of the training and provide all of the materials. So if I'm a company, I'm bringing in my materials, I'm doing all the training, my staff is there, and the prison officials are simply there providing security while the inmates produce the goods. And then I go and I sell these goods on the open market. That was the contract system. We've also had the peace price system. This is strangely still in existence today. A lot of people aren't aware of it, but there's still elements of this in existence today. 
where essentially what we have, and we had back then, companies would, be, would take raw materials, drop them off at a correctional facility, then the facility would be responsible for all aspects of production. So the Department of Correction would be responsible for the machines, the manpower, everything that's necessary to produce a final good. Then I, the company owner, would come back and purchase the finished products at a certain price per piece, the piece price system. And we still have a lot of companies uh, who do this today, all right, from um, soccer balls, Wilson soccer balls. The leather is dropped off at a prison. Inmates cut the leather, stitch the soccer balls together. Wilson comes back and buys the soccer balls. In certain places, Victoria's Secrets drops off the raw materials. Inmates do the sewing and the stitching. Victoria's Secrets comes back to purchase the final product. Uh, inmate labor is used, and there's, some, there's different companies that use certain aspects of this. Well, simply, they'll drop off the raw materials, come back and purchase the final product. Are license plates still made in prison? Mm -hmm. well, that's the state use. <laughs> that's the next one we were coming to. Uh, state use, so we use, license, in, use inmates to produce any good or service for the benefit of the state. So we still produce license plates in prison. Uh, anybody know any other examples of how we use inmate labor for the state? Usually those are volunteers. I know we've used inmate labor to do things like collecting standardized test scores at the facility, but they're not out, out and about necessarily doing it there. So this was at, what, at the central location when we turned in our election. The final, the final finals? Our okay. I hadn't heard about that one, but that, that wouldn't surprise me if we did. Say that again? Linens or mattresses, like sheets or mattresses. Okay. And state facilities? Or to, to make them? Yeah. Okay. We, we use them for, um, if you go down to any state building, the Rachel Jackson building, whatever, and if you see someone cleaning the building, that is an inmate who's on work release. And at the end of the day, a van will come and take them back to whatever correctional facility they're supposed to go back to. If you go into any other state buildings, all of the furniture in there was manufactured by inmates. Uh, and their pricing system is very, very high. Uh, I was a former director with the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. And I remember one of the first, first things I'd learned when I was hiring some new employees, and I wanted to purchase a desk, trash can, stuff to outfit this office and was told I, I could only purchase from Tricor. I had to buy from Tricor, which is the Tennessee offender uh, rehabilitation thing where they make furniture and things. And the same trash can that I could go and get from Office Max for 50 bucks, I had to order from Tricor for 250 bucks. Um, so um, the state has an interesting way of basically recouping money from, <laughs> from the inmate labor. Uh, but we also use inmate labor for any number of things. Uh, the manicuring of the grass at the governor's mansions. Uh, any, any service, for the most part, that, that is a service-oriented task that the governor needs, that's typically done by an inmate. Uh, we have inmates that cut grass at state buildings and do all sorts of stuff on state property. Uh, so inmates use, we use inmate labor to do a lot of stuff to basically help offset expenses that we would have to ordinarily pay someone in the state to use, or, or free or people to do. And we work the wildfires out in California. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And either way, it's, it's, still not a, it's still not minimum wage. Uh, Are there any private companies in Tennessee that are contracted uh, to do prison labor? Not, uh, what we have, because uh, that'll come up in a second, but what we have, for example, at um, Tennessee Prison for Women, there's a call center. And in this call center, uh, they, there's an outside company, and I don't know the name of the company because they won't tell me, uh, but there's an outside company that basically the Tennessee Prison for Women runs their call center. So any of their customers who call in with issues or to renew whatever, they're actually speaking to an inmate at Riverbend, I mean, not at Riverbend, but the Tennessee Prison for Women. And I've seen the call center and I've seen them work and they're very efficient. They get paid by like the keystroke and things of that nature, so they're very uh, good. Uh, we also have, we've used them in the past to do things like when the, the state standardized test scores in terms of gathering all that material. Uh, they used to actually enter speeding tickets. If you got a speeding ticket from a state trooper, 
That information is entered into the data system by an inmate. Uh, I think that's an inmate at Riverbend that will be doing that. Um, I don't think we still do it, but at one point in time, if you call in to renew a hunting and fishing license, uh, you would be speaking to an inmate at Riverbend as you were calling in to renew your hunting and fishing license. So we use inmate labor in a lot of ways that people may or may not be aware of. As a child, uh, back to the public works, my parents drove me down uh, towards uh, the end of Broadway, and that was jail inmates with a guy standing on the back of the pickup truck with his gun as they cleaned up the streets for mm -hmm. uh, 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 Lower Broadway. Mm -hmm. We use them sometimes for parades. When we have big parades, I'm like, oh, if, if the Titans win the Super Bowl. Um, and, <laughs> and, and we have a huge parade, and we got all this confetti. Well, we may, we may need some free labor to help pick up all, all this confetti. So we, we use inmate labor for all sorts of things that are for the benefit of the state. Uh, the state account system, state account system, we actually have some states that do some very progressive things where they oversee the entire production process for a good or service and then they sell it on the open market. There's a prison in Minnesota that makes his own farm equipment. There's a prison in Colorado that has their own tilapia farm. But when you, when you purchase tilapia in a grocery store, you see a nice little label that says fresh spring tilapia, whatever it may say, but you don't know that that actually came from a prison. Uh, so there's some prison industries, some prisons where they develop their own good that is sold and marketed on the open market. The last one is one of the most controversial ones is convict leasing. We've used convict leasing in our country's history for a, a, a great deal of time. Um, but convict leasing essentially is where, as a company, I could go to a correctional facility and basically lease inmate, inmate labor. And when I leased them, they were in my possession for the duration of time that I had them leased. I won't go through all of the slides here, but I tell my class, um, with convict leasing, this gets into Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, uh, it's talked about in the 13th, the movie, uh, that slavery didn't end when we thought slavery ended. All right, that we had the development of things called the Black Codes. The Black Codes, which became these just relatively trivial laws that basically resulted in this mass influx of black inmates. And then these same inmates were then turned around and leased out to companies to manufacture goods, uh, harvest crops, and things of that nature. So convict leasing is a very, very, um, was a very damaging practice in our system. With convict leasing, um, it was essentially, again, you had private individuals who were leased out, um, private individuals who could lease out MA labor, and you may have them for weeks upon months on end, and if you don't know how to house an individual, this is when we see in some old um, movies or in some old pictures, you may see what looks like a circus cage for a tiger, and you see people in it. That was someone who probably leased inmates but didn't have a structure to house them, so he basically had the closest thing that he can think of that was a container, which was a tiger cage that you may typically see at a circus. Um, although leasing goes back to Virginia in 1858, this practice took off largely in the South after the Civil War. After the Civil War, prior to the Civil War, you would have been pretty hard pressed to find a black inmate because that person's labor and that person's time was more valuable to the slave owner. After the Civil War is when we started to see this huge influx of African Americans or black folks in prison. And then we saw the birth of this convict leasing system. So these same inmates who were once free and work in the fields are now inmates and being leased to work the fields. So essentially, the state became the middleman in a lot of places. Um, before Emancipation Proclamation, rather, the only, Virginia was the only state with a convict leasing system. However, after this, every state in the Confederate adopted the practice. Revenues from MA labor generated great profits. For example, uh, there was a stretch of about two decades when 10% of the state's annual revenue in Tennessee for about 20 years came from MA labor. So 10% of the revenue that it took to run the entire state for the better part of two decades came from MA labor. Uh, the leasing system was about economic exploitation. Some individuals in states, as I just mentioned, Tennessee made a great deal of revenue. There's another individual, J.S. Hamilton, uh, had a very basically monopoly over leased inmates from Mississippi. He would lease inmates from the state for, uh, I believe, a dollar a month, and then turn around and sublease them to other private contractors for nine dollars a month, which made a very hefty profit. Um, Tennessee and Alabama, as I mentioned, are two states that have benefited significantly from that 1860 to 1870 range with regards to profits from inmate labor. Physically, it was also very damaging. All right, it was not uncommon for individuals who were leased out to never return. 
in large part, you were placed in the custody of somebody who really didn't know how to detain folks. And what that simply meant was you had a person with a rifle who may have people working, and the first sign of aggressive movement, that person was shot and killed. They didn't know how to contain them. And in most cases, they were minor crimes. If you go back and um, uh, one of the slides I pulled out is what we, ha we had what was called the Black Codes. The Black Codes became a series of relatively trivial laws that were passed right after the Civil War. The Black Codes would make it say, illegal for me as a black recently freed slave to be in a certain location and not have a basically a signed document saying I'm free. Or there's certain curfew restrictions that I have to abide to. Or there's all these menial, like, relatively minor things that are not necessarily crimes per se, but they become crimes when we can kind of write them in, into the black codes as a means of building up this population. So they weren't, they weren't like serious, serious crimes, all right? And if you go back and just Google the black codes, you'll see a lot of the trivial things that came up there. Uh, to give you an idea just how dangerous this was, in 1870, 41% of the convicts that were leased out in Alabama died. This is almost one out of every two that were leased out didn't come back. All right, so convict leasing was a very dangerous practice. Okay? In addition to being you know, exploitative with regards to economics, it was also very dangerous for a lot of people. The uh, Auburn style design, uh, again, won out largely because of labor, and we use labor in all these different fashions. Um, what I want to do now in this last slide before I open up to allow you to ask me any questions is kind of give you a real quick synopsis of how do we go from 1790 to today. So how do we go from 1790 to today? And again, if this was my three-hour version, we would have had additional filler material to tell you about all these different eras, but given that I've got to give you the hour and 15-minute version, um, I'm going to take some of these things out. But. So we get our first prison in 1790, the Walnut Street Jail. Uh, from 1790 to roughly 1820, most of our facilities that we had were built on this Pennsylvania model. With this Pennsylvania model, again, the notion is you stay in complete silence. Uh, you never really interact with anybody else. We know that mental illness peaks during that time period. Uh, eventually, we get to the Auburn system. With this Auburn system from 1820, Auburn system is going to go beyond 1870, but we had a change in our philosophy in 1870 that will come up on the next bubble. But 1820 to 1870, we shifted to where, again, we allow people to work in groups during the day. They simply sleep in their cells at night. During the day, they can work in groups on something profitable, either as a lease convict, public goods, contract system, any of these different things that we showed on the previous slide. 1870 is when we, we went through a reform period. This is our first reform era, where we started to realize religious doctrine was no longer the dominant way in which we wanted to run our prisons. We started to rely more on science, all right? So we thought we can give people vocational training, academic training. Uh, we can give them a whole slew of services to basically make these people uh, better able to go out and find jobs once they were released. That was kind of the goal in this reform period. Then we transitioned from 1910 to 1935 through this industrial prison era, which is kind of a reversion back to some of what we did in the Auburn design, but we really kicked it in high gear here, where the goal was to make prisons as profitable as we possibly could. The base, in the industrial prison era, the goal was to make prisons as profitable as we possibly could, uh, to not only make them self-sustaining, meaning that we can cover all their bills, but we can also basically make additional money for the state. What coincides with 1935? What are we coming up, coming up on? Or what are we in? Winter Depression. Winter depression. Um, so the Depression is when we, we gradually, we had the Ashurst Summoners Act was passed in 1935, which was one of those federal acts that basically brought an abrupt end to it. But that particular era was coming to an end before 1935. It's just there was an act passed in 1935 that brought an abrupt end to it. But then we went through this transition period. From 1935 to 1960, this is kind of our, known as our warehouse period, where essentially all we were basically doing was housing inmates. We, we had taken out all of the job activities. We had taken out all the vocational training. Uh, we were basically just warehousing inmates. Okay? Prisons became overly crowded, uh, significantly more crowded, uh, and there's not a whole lot that we're providing them to do. This is also characterized as the hands-off period. Hands-off in the sense that the Supreme Court didn't get involved as far as managing prisons, okay? And they basically told states, you run your state prison systems how you want to run your state prison systems, we're not getting involved, all right? Uh, so inmates basically didn't have a whole lot of reprieve in terms of how to even vocalize their concerns about how they were being treated. And it wasn't until, as we start to come out of this period, 
was what are we in the 1960s? Civil rights. Civil rights era. We started having individuals who were very highly active, very highly political, uh, very, very highly educated, and so forth. They become inmates now because they're arrested as part of these civil rights activities. Okay, uh, the Elbridge, Elbridge Cleavers and, and folks in, in that line. And so what you started happening was they started crafting their arguments in ways that the, con the Supreme Court had to get involved. When it, be when it became a, these are violations of my constitutional rights arguments, then the Supreme Court got involved. And then we went through a new era with all these lawsuits that had been filed and won on the behalf of inmates. All right, so we started having inmates who, again, with their trainings and the, and the language and the uses of the justice system uh, from the civil rights movement, who are effective in basically pushing us back to a new rehabilitation era, where now inmates, it became like, this was the heyday. The 1960s, 1980s, we were, we were trying everything. All right, you, this was the time period where you can go in as an inmate with a, a ninth grade education and leave with a PhD. And we have, those who, we have some, some who did it. Uh, this was that era where inmates were eligible for Pell Grants, Pell Grants could be used to pay tuition to go to school. Uh, Michigan. Michigan had a pretty infamous program where they literally would take a busload of inmates and drop them off at a community college in the beginning of the day to take classes and then come back and pick them up at the end of the day uh, in this rehabilitation era. Um, that program got ended when one of those inmates went in the front door of the school and out the back door and was caught in Detroit somewhere engaged in another crime. Uh, so that brought an abrupt end to their program. But this particular era, the rehabilitation era stayed until 1980. In 1980, there was a researcher by the name of Robert Martinson. And Martinson was the first person who said, look, we're putting all this money into rehabilitation efforts to, to make things better for inmates, but do we have any evidence that any of this stuff works? And so he did this huge meta-analysis of all these different programs we've been trying all around the country to basically determine what's been the impact on recidivism. Because in theory, we should expect that we should see significant reductions in our recidivism rates. What he concluded, in two words, uh, changed the entire course of our country's history with regards to how we view prisons. He essentially said that nothing works. When he did this huge meta-analysis of all these different studies and looked at the recidivism rates of folks who went through programs versus folks who didn't, he said nothing works. And on those words alone, people came to the conclusion, well, if the outcomes are going to be the same, why are we wasting this money? And at the same time that he said that, was, was starting to jump off in the 1980s. This is Reagan, war on drugs, uh, tough on crime. Uh, we go through this whole shift, all right, the war on drugs that Nixon kind of started and Reagan kind of brought into full fruition. Um, we went through this very, very tough on crime era. All right, there was an era where if you were a politician, you weren't, you weren't winning running a soft on crime platform. All right, everybody had to be tougher than their predecessor, and that was the only way you were going to get votes. And so from 1980 to 2008, this is when we have our, a lot of our mandatory minimums come in. We have our three strike laws come in. Uh, we have all these initiatives that are geared towards being tougher on crime. You do the time, you do the crime, all right? Um, what happens in 2008? The Great Recession, all right? The economy, we hit, hit a bump in the economy. And we're now to this point, all right, we're now to this point where we got two different sides politically in our country for the most part, all right? One side has always been screaming, prisons are bad, bad for people, we need to be breaking this whole thing down. The other side used to not be there, but now it's like, it's costing us what? And so they're coming at it from a cost perspective. This side has always been coming at it from a humanistic perspective. And now we're both saying we need to do something about prisons. All right, regardless of the motivation, one side in terms of money is costing us too much. The other side, we've always been screaming, it's damaging to people, society, yada, yada, yada. But we're in this reconstruction era where we're starting to realize that we can't continue with this fill the dreams philosophy where we're building and they will come in terms of inmates. Um, we gotta do something different. And so we've started to see changes in our, some of our policies in terms of retracting some of our mandatory minimums. Uh, we started to see reductions in some of our overall incarceration rates, uh, the closure of some of our facilities. So we're starting to get to that point to where we're realizing that we can't continue on that particular path. All right. Um, that concludes kind of this particular lecture, but I did want to open it up for any questions that you may have about this or anything else that I've said earlier, and then I'll just continue with what we'll go through the next week. Yeah, Robert, yeah it, was a, it was a meta analysis, meaning that it wasn't necessarily him doing the work. It was basically a, a meta analysis when you do a very critical exam, examination of previous studies and a combination of multiple studies to determine more or less uh, 
what's the overall impact of something. And he just had enough political power and, and was in enough people's ear to where his words alone could kind of swing us to where we were with regards to that. What's your personal opinion about whether he was right? I do not think he was right. Uh, I think as a researcher, a quantitative researcher, um, numbers don't always tell the true story of stuff. Uh, I used to be a diehard, show me the numbers researcher. And I thought that qualitative research was foo foo. I didn't, I didn't really give a lot of credence to qualitative research. Um, but I've done a number of projects, including some projects that I've done for the Tennessee Department of Corrections, where I've kind of done a combination of surveys, where I've got numbers from people, but then also stories and testimonials. And so, where you may not necessarily have these huge, massive swings or things that may not be as glaring in the numbers. Sometimes things will show up in these qualitative narratives that don't show up there, all right? And his particular study was 1980, uh, or when it, came, when it came out. There's been subsequent things that have been done that I think are phenomenal and that I think actually do work. Uh, one of my, any of you ever heard of Men of Valor? Men of Valor is one of the programs that I tell people uh, of, of the 15, or actually 23 years at this point in time that I've been in the Nashville area and been going through, that's one of the programs that I, I put the most I look at it and say that they're doing it right because they have a good system what they do and I'd love to do I might even offer my services to do a study to to prove that their their program works uh, men, of valor. men of valor men of yeah men of valor it's a program and, and you have to excuse where it's housed at but it's a program housed at CCA um, it's a um, what it basically is, is a faith-based program where inmates who uh, have to apply to get into the program they get into the program, they get a heavy dose of uh, you know, psychological thinking better, thinking for change type programs, heavy dose of religion-based programs. They get partnered with a mentor. A uh, mentor is a free world person, and, and how the, the owner or the founder is able to get convince so many free world people, like myself, to come out and on a weekly basis give up an hour or two of their time. And free, free world? Free world. Yeah. That's how they, they, call, they call us free world people oh, in the prison. World. Yeah, free okay. world. <laughs> yeah, outside. Yeah. Yeah. outside people. Uh, but each person has a mentor, and this mentor comes out and meets with you on a regular basis. Uh, then you're released at some point in time, once you get released. Uh, you still have contact with this mentor. Uh, they've actually established, they've built, I think recently they have a like, community of homes that they've built. So when you go from there, you transition into one of the homes to help you get on your feet while you work and save up, and then you transition out of homes, and then you go on your way. So you, that program, you, you're contacted and, and, and on the inside, that contact was maintained on the outside, and then you're kind of transitioned out versus simply something that you do exclusively on the inside with very, and what you do on the inside, it has to be meaningful as well. You can't just, because there's a whole lot of people that do a whole lot of things on the inside, and, and meaning I got this certificate, that certificate, this certificate, and then got out, and two weeks later, they're right back in. So it's, it's not just a matter of how many certificates, but what did you actually do of substance while you're in? And because a lot of times it's just to look good for the pro board. Yes. A lot, of, a lot of other countries actually utilize alternatives to incarceration where they don't send masses of droves of people to prison to begin with. And so they may utilize things like electronic monitoring, uh, boot camps, day reporting centers. They utilize other alternatives to, to just send people to prison. And you, and you get the same outcomes with regards to, I'd actually probably get better outcomes because what happens is, in our society, when we, when we take people and we send them to prison, once you come out, uh, that's when, to me, I think the real struggle begins. Uh, and just, I'm in my class yesterday with 18 uh, or 21 college-age kids, I asked them the question, how much is one year of your freedom worth? Because I was trying, we, we, the lecture we were talking about was wrongful convictions. So I asked them, how much is one year of your freedom worth? And the students settled on it and said, like, well, for $250,000 a year, I'll sit in prison for a year knowing that I can get out for $250,000 for a year. Then I told them, I said, one, $250,000 is not a lot of money. I understand right now in your college world, you think that's a lot of money. That's not a lot of money. But then two, when you get out, what are you now? You're a convicted felon. And in our society, the mere fact that you got to check that box, your job opportunities have just been shrunken. In, in some cases, you've lost your right to vote. In some cases, you don't qualify for certain federal and state assistance programs. So when we send more and more people to prison, the act of going to prison itself, yeah, that's damaging. But it's even more damaging, the long-term effects of that. And then, so in societies where they don't send people, you know, on some level, you avoid that stigma. You avoid a lot of that other stuff that comes with having been an ex-con or going through a prison system. Uh, Dr. Dr. Noble, uh, there was a professor in Peabody College who um, introduced me to the 
book by Carl Upchurch, mm -hmm. Convicted in the Womb. And Dr. Poussant, as well as uh, Dr. Debeo Trillin Pittsburgh, these were speakers at the Vanderbilt here. They said that we have got to go into prenatal to help our kids today. And uh, the FBI Behavior Science Unit has a book called Into the Mind of a Madman. And they are tracing crime back to the womb. My life is of such, a lot of people don't understand me, but this prison stuff is very frightening to me. And the only way I can see myself continuing to be free in America is to incarcerate my family for getting involved in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Because see, I've connected the dogs, and a lot of others have not connected the dogs. And last Sunday at church, they were having a similar discussion. And it was revealed to me that black America is on probation from having been in the civil rights movement. And so what I'm doing to protect myself is to try to create some kind of institution where my family, I have about 30 years of research in family life, mostly through the Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. And so what I see is something that's got to be done in this area, including their medical records. I use my family medical records, things of this nature, so I just want to suggest that for you. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> Many times, young people who end up in prison, the first thing they say is, is what did you do? You know, what did you do to get here? Mm -hmm. And they said the first question should be, what happened to you? Because if you look back in someone's history, there are things that you could have done to avoid that. Yeah, I would agree that if you... Um, if, if, instead of asking what did they do, you ask kind of basically how did they get here, and you go back through those layers, and you you will find all sorts of stuff. And, and I've heard some stories of stuff. You like, I'm I'm just amazed that you're. It's a blessing that you're here right now, uh, in prison, because uh, there are some some pretty pretty horrendous circumstances that people kind of come out of. And I've I've actually we've been on tours before, uh, with with the machismo complex and the the hyper masculine environment that you may find in men's prisons where you don't show weakness like it's it's just a sign of weakness to kind of be too emotional where we've been in tours where i've had a, a young man speaking to our class in the middle of the the pod and he starts crying just because a student will ask him a question something about growing growing up or something like that and it takes this person to a point to where when, and which to me revealed deep emotion because he has to go back in his cell and, and, and live with all these other people that just saw him crying in the middle of this, in this room, but that told me that's the truth. Like, this, this is really what impacted that person kind of thing, so. Kind of in line with that, is it possible to visit jails so that we come in at least in the beginning rather than the river bend where, so that we really can understand why people are there? And how we can change that. Visit, visit, and um, or impact that. Yeah, with 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 the jail side, um, most people don't realize like, jails actually worse than prisons. Uh, That's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jail, jails are are worse than prisons. Um, I think if, if if anything, I would I would push more for better classification, uh, better program opportunities in jail. Uh, most people, most states, kind of, most cities, because cities and counties are who runs the jails, but most take the approach that because that population is so transient and that people are there for a relatively short amount of time, they don't invest in any types of long-term tra training programs, anything like that to better folks. And uh, I was kind of saddened by, you know, their classification system is so weak to where you may have an individual who's a pretrial detainee. I mean, I'm simply there waiting for my court date to come up, but I'm in a housing unit with folks who, you know, I, that I, I'm a, I'm a I, I, well, let me rephrase that. I can be a jail inmate, meaning I'm doing six months on traffic violation or DUI. My cellmate can be someone who's a pretrial detainee first and facing first degree murder charges, or someone who's facing aggravated rape charges, meaning that they have no qualms against victimizing me. I'm there for, I got caught driving drunk one night. Um, whereas, and so in jails, we have a lot of bad things happen to relatively good people in a sense because we mix people and we don't do a whole lot of separating. Um, so you can, we can visit jails uh, in terms of, but you can visit in them, they don't have the overall structure that you have in prisons. Prisons have a more rich structure in terms of programs and systematic volunteer programs and things like that. You know, I, I think mine is just trying to put a stop at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was I would go before jails. But at some point, we have to make it. Prison is kind of the end result. How are we going to 
Have you heard of the, the, the school to prison pipeline? You, you, you got to start at the schools. Uh, you got to start at the schools uh, with some, a lot of our zero tolerance policies and things like that that basically can set a kid on that path to where the end goal is prison, but in that getting to there you had to go through juvie, you had to go to jail, and then you got to prison. But that traces back to school, and then for me it goes even before school into family. But. have come from a country that's considered a third world. Well, what I did not know, in a small city in South Louisiana, beautiful town, that there was a third world. Mm -hmm. And it was not until my husband had to go get a, wanted to go get a doctor that I went back to work and worked at Head Start. 85 applicants for this little Head Start job. I always dreamed of going back to my country and working with poor children. I had no idea that in this great and wonderful country that I love, there was a third world. It was when I had to go make a home visits that I discovered that this little road right here full of water led me to a whole other world of projects that I had no idea existed in this town that I had been living in for many years. Okay, and, and, and it was in Head Start that I realized that I could be a Mother Teresa, uh, it, that, I, that I could be used. I didn't have to go back to my country because it existed. Mm -hmm. And it, it starts with programs like that, where you can give things to a little child. I went for, to a home visit one time, and the mother was 19 years old. She had four children, and the four-year-old was taking care of the three-year-old, and the three-year-old was helping fix a bottle for the baby. And the mother never got up. The baby, the four-year-old left me. I have seen in this gorgeous country things that I never dreamed existed. And so it starts there in the womb, like this man said. Because that mother that was 19 was not only a kid, she had been abused or something. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do something. Prison is a great thing to go visit, but let's visit schools. Let's go to schools and have and, and just go ask teachers, what child are you having to school? And give them love. You don't have to be hugging them. But let me tell you, a hug for those children mean the world, can mean the world. Just a, a nice touch. Uh, I work in one of the nicest neighborhoods in Nashville, in a middle school. The children that came from the projects would not let me touch them. And you know, I started little by little, just doing this to their head. Two months later, this was in August, I worked in the library. I had the blessing of working with all the grades, fifth through eighth, and I just started little by little because I loved I come from a culture where we touch a lot, the Latino culture, we, we're very touchy. And these children in two months were melting. I could feel them melting when I would do this. 
And I always hugged her, and I always asked her, and I always did it in front of cameras. In front of no one could ever accuse me of anything. But by the end of the school year, these children were defending me with any kid that came from another school that tried to be a They would say, Miss Miyaka's nice. You be nice. And that's all it takes. I'm not saying I'm mean, Mother Teresa. I am saying that that is all it takes. Get out of our comfort zones and, and, and reach children. I think uh, on that note, because I, I don't want to be respectful of everybody's time, I think what she's expressing is this notion of, uh, notion of love. Notion of love. Um, and as you were talking, it made me think about, um, a lot of people don't know, but um, my mom was 21 with four kids. She had me when she was 16 years old. My brother's three years older than me. But I had enough people to show me love to where I have a PhD. My sister has a master's degree. My youngest sister has a master's degree. My mom, I paid for her to go back and get her master's degree when she finished school. So but we had enough people that showed me love to where I didn't become a statistic. And so just because in that household that you described, that sounded like my mom's household and the household that I grew up in. But that doesn't mean the end result has to be prison. So for you, the major takeaway is you show kids love, you show people love, and you never know what that person may become because I'm not supposed to be a professor at Vanderbilt according to the background that I grew up from. So thank you guys.